Hello friends, hope you all are doing good and thank you for tuning in for today's gospel message. My name is Jonathan Vergis and I'm part of the Bracknell Gospel Hall. It's a great joy for me to be able to share the good news of my Lord Jesus Christ with you. For today's message, I would like to turn your attention to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John chapter 8 and verse 12. If you do not have a Bible with you, uh, we have the Bible verses mentioned in the description section of this video. And if you can refer to that, we'll read it together. Now, John chapter 8 verse 12 says, Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Here we see the Lord Jesus Christ is making a claim. That he claims himself to be the light of the world. He goes on to say, whoever follows him will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This may seem like a strange claim for someone to say that he is the light. A few days ago, my friend Josh spoke about another claim of Lord Jesus Christ on the same channel, where the Lord Jesus Christ was claiming that he is the Good Shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now there is something interesting and unique about the I am claims of Lord Jesus Christ. He never says, I am a light or I am a shepherd or he doesn't even imply that he's one of the lights amongst all the other lights. But he very specifically says, I am the light. He's making an exclusive claim that there is no other light other than him for the world. He is the light of the world. Now, if he's making an exclusive claim like that, I believe it deserves a serious attention from our side. What is Lord Jesus Christ trying to tell us here? If we turn back to Isaiah chapter 42, it talks about God's promise of a Messiah who was to be sent to the earth. This was a prophecy done more than 600 years before Lord Jesus Christ actually came to the earth. Now, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1 says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. This verse talks about a promise of a Messiah who is going to be sent to the earth, to the world. To save the world. Verse 6 says, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. Verse 6 of Isaiah chapter 42 talks about this Messiah being sent to the world as a light to the world. The very same thing that Lord Jesus Christ claimed. And verse 7 says, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison of those who sit in darkness. Now this is exactly what Lord Jesus Christ claimed. He said, I am the light of the world. Those who follow me will not walk in darkness. This validates that Lord Jesus Christ is not just a random person making a random claim. But he is the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. And he wants to tell us today that he is the light. A light so important for our soul. So important that he had to come down to this world to declare that he is that light. And that he can save us from the darkness that is in the world. Not just that, but he is also claiming and he is also promising that he can give us an eternal life. He can take us to heaven. Now, we all consider COVID-19 as a dark phase of this era, don't we? 5.7 million people have been infected so far. We're all worried for our jobs. We're all worried for the health and safety of our family and our own lives. And there's so much uncertainty about the situation. No one knows how things are going to be tomorrow or a few weeks from now. But we're all looking for a light at the end of the tunnel, aren't we? And in times like these, this verse gives me a comforting hope. Not just a momentary relief, but something incomparable and far greater to look forward to. 
In this world, the Lord Jesus Christ has promised me and has given me a calm assurance that no matter what happens in the world, my soul is safe in his hands. My soul will not be lost. And through this verse, he is offering the same to all of us today. He wants to tell us about the greatness and the wonders of this light. And he wants to shed a light on the beauty of the person that he is and what he has done for us and for our souls. But for that, we need to understand the darkness Lord Jesus Christ is talking about. He's talking about spiritual darkness, not physical darkness. Spiritual darkness refers to the sinful state of the world. It refers to the evil that is in the world. It refers to the darkness of sin and the evil that's inside our heart. More importantly, it refers to man's broken relationship with God. There is an enmity that exists between a sinful man and a holy and a righteous God. We all, we all understand physical darkness, don't we? Darkness is the absence of light and it literally hides things that are usually visible during the day. Now, imagine having a good time on a sunny afternoon in a beautiful country park or a garden. Now, if it were dark and dingy at that time, or if it's pitch dark, will we be able to, un to appreciate the beauty of nature there? Will we be able to enjoy the beauty of creation? Certainly not. Let's take another example. For, for instance, we were in a, in, in, a, in a room. We were asked to walk across one end of the room to the other end. Let's consider this room as a warehouse. And it's dark over there, dark and, ding, dark and absolutely pitch dark. No light whatsoever. We don't know what all objects are kept in that room, in that warehouse. And all we know that know is that we have to walk from one end of the warehouse to the other end. Now, because there is so much darkness, we don't know what dangers lie inside over there. There could be a sharp object lying on the floor and we could very well step over it. We could, we could injure ourselves. Or we could walk into a, a big machinery kept there and we could, we could possibly dash our foot against it and hurt our foot. Or there could be some objects piled over each other, stacked over each other, and we accidentally go and touch it and it loses balance and it falls over us. That could be fatal. Darkness does not offer us any security. It does not assure us any safety. In fact, it can be life-threatening. Now imagine if someone turns a light in that room, turns on a light in that room, and we can easily spot the dangers and navigate across a safe path in that room. But one thing is sure, darkness in that room does not assure us any safety. It is life-threatening. Now we can apply the same concept to spiritual darkness just that it's far more worse than physical darkness. It's far worse than physical darkness. The Lord wants to tell us that a broken relationship with God doesn't end well. That's what spiritual darkness is. The Lord wants to tell us that spiritual darkness doesn't end well. A broken relationship with God doesn't end well. The Bible in Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, Wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. The wage due for those who sin, those in spiritual darkness, is death. This death is not referring to physical death. This death refers to death on the judgment day. The Bible says in Hebrew chapter 9 and verse 27, It is appointed for man once to die and thereafter judgment. There is, a, there is a judgment day after a physical death. And we're all going to face God on judgment day. And if, if we have only lived a life of sin on this earth, a life of spiritual darkness, a life of broken relationship with God, unfortunately, we will see ourselves on the wrong side of God's judgment on the judgment day. John chapter 3 verse 20 says, For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Now, just as physical light exposes objects in the dark, spiritual light 
exposes our sin and the evil residing in our hearts. I believe we all understand what sin is. God has a divine standard of judging good and evil. Sin means missing that divine standard set by God, or simply put, violating or going against the laws of God. We all believe there is sin in us, don't we? We have all sinned. The law of God says, I am the Lord your God, you shall not have any other gods before me. That means we are supposed to honor God and give him all the glory and honor. But then several times in our lives, we have not given the honor that God deserves. We have set our minds on material things. We have gone after money and fame. We have set idols before us and we have worshipped those idols instead of giving God the glory and honor. We are guilty. We are guilty sinners. We are guilty of breaking that law. Law of God says thou shalt not steal. We have all stolen. We have all stolen something in our childhood. We have stolen something from somebody in our school or in our neighborhood. Some of us may even be stealing from the taxes we are supposed to pay. We are guilty sinners. We are guilty of stealing. Law of God, God says thou shalt not lie. Have we not lied in our lives ever? Have we not said a white lie? Have we not exaggerated things beyond the facts just a little bit? If we have done all that, we are guilty sinners. We are guilty liars before God. The fact here is violation of God's law in any number or any measures makes us sinners. Now, if we have realized that we have sinned, we can either do something about it or just let it go and move on as if nothing happened. Now, we do that several times, don't we? It is possible that we know that we have sinned, but we prefer not to make a big deal out of it. We rather convince our conscience that it is okay and no one, no one will ever find out. But God in Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 to 10 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. My friends, God searches our hearts. He knows what's hidden inside our hearts. We may, we may try and convince our conscience that nothing has happened. We may try and pretend like there is no wrong that has happened and we may move on. But God knows every sin, every sin hidden inside our heart. The word of, word of God with its light is exposing the darkness that is inside our heart. The verse we just read says, I will give to every man according to his ways which means he will judge us for every deeds we have done, whether they are known or hidden in our heart. But friends, there is hope. And that is the good news. Because the very same verse that we that spoke about the wages of sin also speaks about a gift of eternal life. It says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's an offer of a gift so precious. That free gift is eternal. It's eternal life. Life everlasting. With Jesus Christ, our God in heaven. It's a free gift for sinners. People who have lived in darkness. It's an offer as a free gift for us. But it cost Lord Jesus a lot. It cost him his life. And we've got to understand why. John chapter 3 verse 16, it's a very well-known verse. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have eternal life. Now friends, God loves us so much, especially the ones who are sinners especially the ones who are living in spiritual darkness. 
He cares so much for us, so much for the ones who are struggling in sins, that he sent his son to earth as a human 2,000 years ago to die for our sins. Now that is strange, isn't it? Why would God cause his son to die for us? You see, God is good in all his ways. He is, he is holy and righteous in all that he does. He can do no wrong. He is righteous. His divine righteousness demands justice for the sins people have committed, for the sins we have committed. And if the wages of sin is death, sinners must die. Because of the sins, sinners must be punished. If they're not punished, then God is not just. But Bible in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. About 2,000 years ago, Lord Jesus Christ died on a cross for us. He took our sins on himself. The darkness of sin and evil that was in us, he took that on himself and died a sacrificial death for our sins. It was a death of substitution. Justice of God demanded that sinners must die. So the Lord Jesus Christ, he took our sins on himself. As if he sinned and not us. And he died a cruel death on the cross instead of us. But that's not all. He didn't just die and vanish away. On the third day after his death, he resurrected from the dead. He rose victorious over death. He appeared to his disciples and several others after his resurrection. Friends, death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him there. He rose victorious over death. And that's a matter of celebration, that he's not dead and gone, but he's rose again from the dead. He is alive and living. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 says, Now if we confess our sins to the Lord, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, there is forgiveness. Although there is darkness in our hearts, although there is sin inside of us, God is offering us forgiveness. Because the penalty of sins is already paid for on the cross. Lord Jesus Christ already paid the penalty that was due for the sin. The wages of sin that was due was already paid on the cross. Now we do not have to suffer for our sins. While he was dying, he said, It is finished. That was the last cry of Lord Jesus Christ. It is finished. There is nothing left to be done now. The work that was needed or the penalty that was to be paid was paid in full. We can be guilt-free now. He says, I am the light of the world. Those who follow him will be saved from the darkness of sin, evil and death. The second death. The death on the judgment day. To follow him, all we must do is believe on him. Believe on his death. Believe on his resurrection. Accept him as our God and our Lord. He is inviting us today to accept him and follow him. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is talking about people who were saved. This verse tells us one, one fact, that only faith in Lord Jesus Christ will save us. I hope you are able to put your trust on him. Put your trust on him completely. Believe on his death. Believe on his resurrection. Believe on the, on the wonderful person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the light. If you follow him, you will never be in darkness. But you have a promise, a blessed promise of the light of life. Accept him as your God and your Lord and you will be saved. May God bless you all. 
and thank you for your time.